that we are talking here are uh, uh, very, very debatable. And um, this is a graduate level class. So uh, uh, we are seeking the truth together, yes? So uh, the lecture I have prepared uh, has three parts. The first part, we're gonna talk a little bit about the basic uh, machine learning cycle and, and stop a little bit on cross-validation. Then the, the meat of, 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 of the lecture is, um, is discussion about human in the loop cycle and um, a little bit the role of the data scientist uh, in the upcoming years, uh, um, particularly with auto ML uh, gaining um, uh, more momentum. And uh, then I'm going to push for my opinions that is uh, uh, we need to make our brains uh, worth their uh, glucose and uh, focus on improving inputs and outputs of systems. And I'm going to finish uh, a little bit uh, discussing how feature engineering can help you in, in that setting to conclude with um, the concept of data sta staging, releasing data in stages. So uh, in the job part of the system, we have a very complex uh, machine learning system that was a cascade of, of uh, classifiers train on, on different subsets of the data and with different parameters. So in that sense, training that system was quite complex uh, from the perspective of the cycle. And also it was um, <clears throat> uh, how not to make that um, system overfit, which is something we will discuss on, on this lecture, was also quite a challenge. Uh, so, I will be using the following terms in this lecture, supervised learning <clears throat> in the idea of, of training a classifier or a regressor. So training something that uh, div divides instances into a number of uh, before known classes or try to predict the value of a floating point number as a regressor. Uh, in machine learning, uh, particular introductory classes, uh, courses, normally you have the, the data that you are running your algorithm on but uh, for the purposes of, of um, this discussion, we're trying to distinguish the raw data from features, yes, which are things that uh, you, you do some steps from the raw data to compute. And then you have instances and the, the target class and the target value. So the, the main machine learning cycle, uh, the, 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 the basic building block is you take the, the features, the feature vectors, you split them into a train set and a test set. You build a model using the train set and you obtain a, a train model and then you evaluate that train model over the test set, getting evaluation results. So these three, three steps, uh, you, you can even call, call it the, the Kaggle model. Yes, this is uh, the, the same way you, you, you participate in online competitions. Uh, so here is a small example uh, of, of this um, uh, uh, basic cycle from um, chapter six of um, the real world machine learning uh, book. Um, the data they use uh, was obtained through a, uh, a Freedom of Information Act. Um, it's 14 million records of GPS location where a taxi in, in, in New York was uh, um, hired and uh, where the person got off, how they pay for the ride, how much the ride cost, and what was the tip? Yes, what was the, the extra money, the, the gratuity? That is not a very popular concept in Europe, but in, in US people uh, give extra money to thank the worker, and that money goes directly to the worker. Um, so the feature that we're trying to predict what type of things people use to, to do tipping. Um, and for features, they use things like uh, the distance to, to the center of the city, the payment type, and, and other things. And target value was, as I mentioned, the tip. The metric they used to evaluate the system to tell whether one model was better than another is um, <clears throat> the um, it's a, a metric that captures the um, the quality of, of the system as it gets uh, more or less precise. It's not that important for, for this discussion. It's, it's a metric used uh, for regression. Uh, you can imagine you can use other metrics like <clears throat> just the uh, absolute error or, or the square error. 
the point of, of, of uh, this data is that when they train a system on this, they get very good results, yes? And the results are actually too good. This is unbelievably good. And they're all dominated by a single feature, payment type. It can be cash or credit card. So knowing that feature, it seems that you can predict how people are going to tip a taxi in New York City. So when they drill further, they realize that most of the data, a big percentage of the data were zeros. Yes, that every time somebody pay with, with cash, it is recorded as they give no tip, yes? And it seems that um, the people um, filling up this data decide not to report that they got this tip so because otherwise they will have to pay taxes on it, yes? So in that case, dropping all these uh, wrong data produced much better results, yes? And then they found out that the GPS location of the destination is the main predictor and trips around the center of town, and no tips, and they got a, a better model and, and some interesting results. The, the point I want to mention is that the basic mod, um, cycle it's, it's prone to make this type of mistakes. You, you just take your data, you run the model, you get a number, and, and without doing any, more, any further analysis, you, you may just got the wrong model. Yes, because your data may be wrong or because the things you are evaluating are not correct. And um, so, so in that sense, I, I like this example because it gives you this idea that uh, the, the basic uh, uh, model of data model evaluation is, is too narrow-minded, yes? So what we will explore in this uh, lecture are expansions over this model using it as a building block. Uh, this is an example of uh, the general class of problems of overfitting, yes? Um, that is to make, train a model that fails to generalize, yeah? Uh, another way of thinking about it is that you're memorizing the training data. Um, I don't know if you have heard the expression, a stopwatch is accurate. It gives you the exact time twice a day. Yeah, so you have a, a watch that is fixed in some position, the, the, the needles are fixed in some position, well, it will give you uh, an exact time twice a day. Um, <clears throat> so when we're doing machine learning, what we care is about fitting a model to some existing data, but we don't want to do something with that data. Our purpose of generalization is extrapolating from that data to unseen data. But if we follow too closely the original training data, then it will fail to generalize. Uh, that's why we always say that we need to use a separate test set when we're trying supervised learning models. If we evaluate on the train set, the results will be too optimistic and will not be representative of the behavior on new data. So that's one type of overfitting, but there are other types too. Um, for example, your training data may be an inaccurate sample of the overall population. So if, for example, if you have collected data only in the summer, yeah, and when winter comes, particularly in Canada, things will be very different. Um, you can also overfit the model that you are using. Yes, you, you, your sample may lead you to believe that certain models will be better, but a different model will work better in production or the parameters for the model. And of course, you can also overfit the type of features you are using. So how do you avoid overfitting? Uh, many people, particularly, the practical machine learning end up being a, a race against overfitting. Um, one of the key things to avoid overfitting is to test on held out data few times. Yes, every time you, you, you test on, on some held out data, um, you're in a way consuming it. You are gaining some understanding about that test data and making decisions based on it. Um, therefore, uh, if you keep doing that, you will have a system that looks very good on that test data, but it will not generalize to new data. Um, is that for the reason that in the job party system and in general, I, I advise to take all the data and, and use it in stages, something we will discuss at the end of the lecture. Sorry, Pablo? Yeah. 
Can you briefly explain what do you mean by test data and why it's held out data? Sure. Uh, so held out here just means test data. There are synonyms. So it's like uh, here. Um, yeah, but also what do you mean by test data, train and test? Okay, this thing over here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, um, you, you take uh, the input data you have and you split it into some data you're going to use to train and some data you're going to use to test. And that test data is also called held out data. Yeah, because we are held in it from, from using for training. Um, uh, thank you. I, introductory lectures are always much complicated than others. To be as representative of the overall population as possible, which means in terms that the, the splitting between train data and test data has to be done um, as randomly as, as it is possible. I'm going to discuss that a little uh, more now that we see cross-validation, because sometimes you, you need to make sure that certain classes or certain information is on the train set and in the test set. So you cannot do it completely at random, yes. But yeah, it has to be as much random as possible. Otherwise, you won't get an accurate uh, evaluation of your system. Presentative for the overall population? Uh, no, we don't. I mean, you have the, the statistics answer, which is uh, you, you, you have certain assumptions about the, the, the overall probability distribution of the, the, the whole population, and you measure the, the statistics of that. Uh, in machine learning, we go from the other direction that is uh, more empirical. Uh, so you will measure, measure the fact that the, um, it's good representative because you have a trained model, you, you, you are using it in production, and it's behaved in a way that is comparable to how it behaves before, yes. It's, uh, it's more something that uh, you have to keep in mind rather than that you can measure. In statistics, you start from a model and, and, and you have assumptions about the model and you spend a lot of time making sure that the model makes sense with reality. That's why you can measure things in terms of, oh, is this sample correct or not? Uh, but that also means that you can only address problems that you have such models, yeah? Machine learning gets out of that but then you lose all those goodies. Um, <clears throat> a, a very good example of this is the Bonferroni correction. <clears throat> yes, in statistics, you know that if you, you have a statistically significant result, well, things are good. But if you test even in the same data 10 things, one of them just by chance will look statistically significant. So you cannot do that. You cannot use the same data to test 10 hypotheses. That's cheating. Yes, and, and to avoid that, then you, this Bonferroni correction say, well, you test 10 things, that your, your, your uh, uh, statistical boundaries, you have to divide them uh, by, by a correction. You have to divide them and, and they become much more tight if you are testing so many things over the same data. Uh, we, we still don't have something like that for machine learning. Yes, all we know is that the more you quiz your, your test set, the more, the higher the chances are <clears throat> for overfitting. This is something that we know, but uh, it's not that uh, clear within the practitioners that that's the case. Um, so besides staging the, the test set and changing it, etc., the ways that you avoid overfitting is to reducing the capacity of the model basically having a model with less parameters. You, you, you strive to have a dumber model, a model that is less smart because you can learn less things about the training data and that will make, have more chances that will generalize better on test data. Yeah, so it will work worse on training, but it will generalize better. An example of that is early stopping on neural networks. You are training the network and if you keep training it, it will, uh, produce less error on the train set, but you stop it when the network haven't uh, memorized the train set so well. So there is a technique uh, that is used to, to avoid um, training, um, um, having a, a, a test set that is separated from the training data, 
call it cross-validation. And uh, there is a little bit of a misconception that cross-validation uh, will not overfit in the general case. I mean, it will it, it give you models that are evaluated without overfitting, but that if you are using cross-validation, you can still end up with a solution that has been overfit. So let's discuss uh, cross-validation uh, in detail. So when you have when you don't have enough data, uh, if you have small data sets, um, the data you use for evaluation, this test set, this held out data, yes, is not being used to, to allocate, um, it's not being used to optimize parameters of the model. So there is this feeling that that data is being lost. Yeah. Um, so then these techniques helps you uh, avoid that problem. And what you do in cross-validation is you take your training data that is in, and you split it into N parts. That we call them faults, yes? And this splitting uh, has to be done as much as random as possibly done. And, uh, and then you train and test the system, the machine learning system, N times. So if you do a 10-fold cross-validation, you will train 10 different machine learning models and evaluate them. And for each fold, you use the remaining n minus one folds to train the model. So if you have 10 fold cross validation, you use the data from nine folds to train a model and you test it in, in, the, in the held out fold. Yeah. And then that will give you labels over the whole system and you can compute metrics on each of these different models, etc. <clears throat> I, I keep saying you, you, you split things as, as much randomly as you can because there is certain um, uh, data sets that, that cannot be split uh, completely at random, yes? For example, if the instances are not actual instances, but you have some sort of structure over the instances, yes, you, you cannot uh, <clears throat> split them completely at random. Say, for example, you have user logs, yes? All rows for the same user should all fall in this, should all be in the same fold. Yes, otherwise the, the, the systems you are training will not be representative of the behavior in production. You, you have information about one user that is being leaked from training to test set, but in general, the system will, will operate on completely new users. Um, second, uh, if you have um, classes that are a little un Get that are very unbalanced, if you don't make sure that at least a few instances for each class appear in every fold, you, you will not be able to train a model or to test it for, for those classes. So that's called a stratified cross-validation. It's normally when people say cross-validation, they talk about that. <clears throat> I, uh, however, would like to bring out the issue that the idea of, of, of wasting data in, in, in evaluation is, is, uh, is not the correct mindset because um, you are training a model for a purpose and understanding how well the model behaves is uh, much more valuable than the uh, marginal improvement from that uh, data you are keeping held out, yes? If 20% more data makes your model change drastically, then you, you, you are not using a model that is stable for the amount of data you have. Stability in, 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 in uh, machine learning models is, is quite important for production use. If, if every time you train the system, you get a very different system, then uh, it's very hard to uh, <clears throat> do any quality assurance or understanding or, or, or improvements, yeah? So if, if you have something that is so unstable, you really don't have much of a model, yeah? Uh, so you're much better served by a simpler model with fewer parameters that is more stable over the available data you have. And the other aspect is that if you use um, held uh, data and understand clearly how the model is behaving, uh, maybe some of the issues the model has can be, um, <clears throat> um, some of the shortcomings can be addressed with non-machine learning systems and data or, or custom programming, yes? So, so in a way, you're a, a deliverable that has a higher error rate, but is much better 
understood is a better quality deliverable. So I have now a, a small example of cross-validation to try to uh, ground these concepts. This is a, a subset of the UCI adult data set. So this, this is a census data from the US. Uh, we're trying to predict a binary class that is whether the person was making more than 50,000 US dollars a year in aggregate income or less than $50,000. <clears> and you have information as uh, what type of uh, work class they are doing, whether they are uh, working in the private sector, in the federal government, local government, <clears throat> the type of education they have, the occupation, the relationship, race, uh, gender, and the native country. So for this uh, demonstration, I just took 10 rows. So I got um, three folds with 10 rows each, yes? And um, here you have in italic, the ones who are over 50K and uh, the other ones are under 50K. And this was taken at random, you, but uh, some folds have uh, more of, of, of the one class than the others. And, um, the, the way the cross-validation then works is that we will take the first this, uh, 20 instances and you train a model on that. And then you test that in, in here. Yep, and that will be the first, um, the first result. Then uh, we take these uh, two, uh, these 20 instances and we test the model on these ones. And then we take these 20 instances and we test it on this, yep. And that's how cross-validation works. And for model, I use a, a decision tree that is simple to run and they tend to overfit pretty badly on small data sets. Um, and it's because I'm trying to highlight one of the problems that cross-validation has is, um, this is the results. The first system give you a 50% accuracy. The second one gives you a 30% accuracy and the third one gives you a 40% accuracy. So that, that on itself already poses the question of how well is this system working? Well, we have three systems. So you can take the average between these three numbers. We can take how they label the whole data set. And the other aspect is that the models that the system has learned are very different. This is a very small decision tree this is very, very, very big, and this is somewhere in between, yeah? So, uh, so basically the, the issues uh, with uh, uh, cross-validation is that you have multiple models, multiple results, and an unevaluated final model. Let's look at them in, in detail. Uh, so because each fault trains a different model, that makes error analysis very difficult because the models may be potentially very different. So if you wanted to understand where the system is failing, well, now you only no longer have one system. Um, on the other hand, if the systems are so difficult, uh, different, then you know you are having stability issues, which is uh, very positive. Uh, you don't need to do cross-validation to analyze stability. You can use the general technique of bootstrapping where you take different uh, random subsets of the data and see whether the system, uh, the, the trained models behave very differently. And there are two ways that you can uh, take the result from cross-validation and compute them into an aggregate metric. One is, as I was uh, mentioning, just take the average of, of the, the metrics per fault. So that's called the macro evaluation or macro averaging. In, in the example we have before, we'll be taking 50 plus 30 plus um, uh, 40 and, and dividing it by three. Another way is to realize that each, um, all the data in the, in, in, in the data set has been labeled by um, a model, yes? When, when we took the first two folds and, and we tested on the third fold, that means that all the items in the third fold have a label associated with it. And such, then we can take all those labels and compute metrics uh, over the, the data set. That's called micro evaluation or micro averaging. So normally these two results uh, disagree with each other, 
and sometimes very strongly. Uh, well, and again, uh, this is similar to, to looking into bootstrapping. Interestingly, the, the variance of macro evaluation is a good estimator of the stability of the model over the available data. Uh, another issue that is uh, may not be that uh, uh, important um, <clears throat> unless you are you're doing uh, production deployment is that, uh, well, you have three models. Which one are you going to deploy? Yes, but uh, something that people normally do is, well, they do cross-validation to get an idea about the error, and then they train a final model over all the data. But that model over all data is, is not evaluated at all. And if the whole data set triggers some pathological condition on, on the, in the machine learning code, say like it sets all the parameters to zero, we won't know. Yes, it, the, the model uh, haven't been evaluated. That's, that's unlikely, the pathological conditions are unlikely. But it is something that does happen in, in, in production environments is that sometimes the data gets corrupted for one reason or another. The, the hard drive runs out of this space. Uh, the RAM is not enough for the whole data set, etc. And that results in an unusable model that and, and that's because goes unchecked. Okay, so that's that's for the uh, basic cycle that I have. Now let's talk a little bit more about human in the loop. Personally, because I care about um, the human in the loop and the error analysis, I recommend not using cross validation. I, I recommend using um, say uh, eighty percent. Uh, training, 10% development, and 10% final test. Yeah. So, so um, my, my point is that if you use cross validation, it becomes very hard to then improve the model by understanding which error, what type of errors the model is making. But if you're going to do cross validation, uh, you will, it depends on the data you have, but you, you, Definitely want to have enough data to train a, an informed model. So for many data sets, fivefold is, is it will produce you produce training sets that are choose even too small. So you may need to go to tenfold cross -value. So yeah, so so the um, for the overfitting, you have to keep an eye on on the error rate you are getting on train set versus the error you are getting on test set. And if you have parameters that you can uh, adjust, what you normally do is you you try to adjust them so those errors uh, are uh, are reasonable. Like for example, in decision trees, one of the parameters you adjust is pruning. You say, oh, I'm going to use a decision tree that has only two levels. You see the, the first one performs better at 50% accuracy because it's a smaller tree. So in a way, it has less parameters, so it's less smart. Yes, these ones have more parameters, but that smartness actually goes against. In 2011, uh, two professors from the MIT Center for Digital Business published a very short uh, ebook called uh, Race Against the Machine. And um, it's uh, from economy, and they are discussing the impact of uh, new technologies in the uh, market and the labor force. And um, I, I highly recommend the the, the ebook. It's a, it's a very informative read, and it includes the um, uh, following quote: "New research by Otto and Dorn." Um, found that the relationship between skills and wages have recently become U-shaped. In the most recent decade, demand has fallen most for those in the middle of the skill distribution. We, we all know that uh, uh, technology is uh, getting people out of jobs, but, but we have the idea that the people who lose jobs are the ones who kind of don't get maintain their skills up to date, uh, technology speaking. Uh, so what... Um, has been found is that recently that's no longer the case. Yes, yeah, so, so this has become like a U shape or like a, a bathtub distribution. 
if you have uh, no skills, then you're, you're safe. Yes, uh, the computers are not going to take your, your job that you don't get a lot of money out of the job, but it requires very fine motor skills. Yes, so replacing you by a robot, the robot costs years and years of your salary. So the jobs that we are losing are, are the, the, the mid-level ones, uh, like at the middle, like, like the, the bank clerks uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind because uh, many jobs uh, in computers are soon going to be under the same category. Yes. So if you're doing a task in data science that seems automatable, then it will be automated. Yes. Um, AutoML that is discussed now is, is going to uh, move many jobs that can be uh, done today by data scientists to the end users. Yes. You you will not need to, to have a data science to do something that somebody who is familiar with Excel can do. Yes. Um, so again, the, the, the U shape means that the job at risk are not the lowest skills. Um, so there is this polarization of, 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 of labor in demand. Um, so what the ebook uh, says is the future is hybrid, yes that um, the way to, to stay competitive and, and to uh, be employed is to um, find a way to work together with the computer to accomplish things that the computer cannot do by itself and uh, we humans cannot do by ourselves. Um, and it takes the example of uh, translating documents from uh, one human language to another. Nowadays, uh, professional translators no longer work as uh, when I was young, That we give you a piece of uh, a document and the person will translate it and give you back the translation. These days, these uh, jobs are all computer-based and the world revolves around uh, doing edits to machine translated drafts and they get paid by the amount of edits they do. Really, they don't get paid by the amount of edits. They get forced to finish the job with a less number of edits. It's, it's a very specific metric the way they get paid. The job satisfaction is not very high for people doing this, but this is how uh, machine transla uh, human translation has evolved as a completely hybrid model. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, we as data science need to make our human side count. Uh, somehow uh, in, in, in data science uh, when learning, we focus a lot in the processes and these and that, and, and, and there is a lot of information to, to, to grow. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, many times uh, looking for a, a recipe, very straightforward and short, uh, is, is, is not the way to make our human side count. The, to me, we can either go for uh, algorithms, yes, trying to focus on machine learning and their engineering, yes. So if you have a computer science background and, and very focused interest, try to make a career on that. We can go for the data, for the domain, and improve the input to, that goes into the machine learning. Or we can go for the problem, the business side, and try to improve the output of the system. So these are the, uh, the last two are the things I, I want to discuss. So if you want to improve uh, the input, uh, you know, memory works in a strange way. Uh, you can make these little hooks. So I have a poem here by uh, Dylan Thomas that starts saying, do not go gentle into the that good night, old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Yes? So what I want you to remember out of this is that you have to rage, rage against the input data. Yes? Uh, it's very tempting to believe that your problem is defined when they give you the input data. Input data is always the, conver the start of a conversation. Yes? Uh, if somebody gives you some input data, that doesn't mean that that's the data they have. That's the data they give you. So you have to seek to, to better understand it, and you you find errors on it, like missing data. You, you will have to think ways to uh, plug in those holes on the data. Uh, you, you can get a, a lot of mileage by trying to understand um, more information about the processes that produce the data. And you can also seek to expand that data from, from other sources of information. You see, all these things uh, 
uh, you need a, a, an able human to do it. Yeah, and, and you will really be profiting from uh, your uh, humanness. So <clears throat> therefore, you, you can try to expand the data you, you, you got. Uh, you can compute new things uh, on, on, on values you have there. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and then, as I was mentioning, you can use external data, yes, uh, that you imagine that will be useful. For example, if you have uh, geographical data, you can add distances to major cities, yes. And all these things are very domain dependent. So in a way, uh, you start working with some data in a domain and you become more and more of a uh, expert in that domain. And many times you have data that has, as I was mentioning, have holes there. So you have to find a, a, a smart ways to, to make that uh, missing data as um, uh, in opus as possible, because otherwise your machine learning system might uh, take it to heart. And, uh, and there are different techniques that you can use for that, and you, you will most probably be uh, studying them uh, through your master. Other type of things you can do that uh, if you're coming from an Excel uh, background is, uh, and I think you have seen it at the beginning of this course, to do pivoting, yes. This type of data transformation sometimes have a big impact uh, on the performance of, of machine learning. The other thing you can do is to improve the output. Yeah, and, and again, this is a, a place where we um, tend to get uh, into a very, um, we are a computer type of uh, mindset, yeah. So we train a model and we evaluate it over this uh, held out data or fault. So which metrics do we use? Sadly, uh, we, we tend to just use the metrics that come with the machine learning toolkit, yes? But that doesn't need to be that way, yes? Uh, discussing with, with the end users of the trained model can uh, help us make a custom metric that, that can really help for the, for the use cases of the model. And also, well, sure, the computer needs a metric and, and we are doing things with that, but uh, once the metric, uh, when the system has been trained, then it's not only about quantitative metrics, we, we also need, can do qualitative evaluations and have users and experts see the result and discuss whether any improvements are needed. So, in general, what we want is that these metrics align with business needs, yes? And um, uh, working with multiple metrics is, is hard because it's difficult to optimize multiple objective functions, yes? And computers are not very good at that. But humans are very good at it. Actually, we, we do it all the time, you know, work like balance, uh, politics, so all these things are uh, uh, optimizing multiple metrics. <clears throat> For example, uh, in question answering, um, the community will compute 36 different metrics on the results. Imagine that, 36, yeah? Some metrics were very obvious, like how many questions did, did you answer right? You know, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. But, but the, some of the most informative ones were quite exotic, like the average of one over R, where R is the rank of the first correct answer in the list of answers returned for each question. So, so these things were, didn't come implemented on scikit-learn. You, you have to code them, but they help you get a much better insight about how your system is behaving. So when you have these uh, type of ideas about how to improve the output, then that helps you drive the improvement of, of, of the model. For an example, um, let's say that you realize by talking with people that it is possible that your question answering system says, I don't know. And, and, and the users will be happy with that answer, yeah? They actually prefer a system that is quiet rather than gives wrong answers. Um, so you see, you, you, you might be working under a certain assumption that you're building a question answering system, but then actually the, the problem is different. Now we are building a system that decides whether to answer a question and then provides an answer. Yeah. So going from always give an answer irrespective of how uncertain you are to fine tune a threshold so the system answers as many questions correctly for the ones it chooses to answer, that this can have a great 
a, a dramatic impact on, on both the way the model is constructed, its use, and its utility. And the other aspect is that once you define metrics, yes, of course we know that, that given a metric, the machine learning will optimize that metric and, and get you a, a model for that. But also these metrics affect the, the human side of things quite a bit. We humans, in a way, tend to overfeed metrics uh, quite badly. Um, there is a story from colonial India, the colonial times in India, where the British uh, saw a problem of uh, infestation of uh, cobra uh, snakes. So they start paying people for, for each dead cobra. Yeah. Well, then people realize that killing cobras was, was very profitable. So they start breeding the cobras and they actually make it much worse because the population of cobras then explode. And similar thing happens in startups. There are something thing called vanity metrics in startups that always increase like the total number of visitors. So if you focus on those metrics, it's gonna look like your startup is doing great, but in reality it's not. So spending time to understand the, the output and how it fits in a larger picture, um, it will mean that the whole venture of having these models and, and having the models evolving over time, et cetera, uh, can have a much better impact on, on, on the business side. Uh, questions, comments? Okay. So I'm going to talk now briefly about AutoML. Yes. Um, if all we are doing is just choosing a model and some parameters, well, why not just have a machine doing it, yes? And in reality, yes, computers can just choose models and parameters. The problem is that the search space is huge, yes? Uh, like really, really, really large. But um, on the other hand, many data sets behave very, very similarly. So you, you can have parts of that data, uh, large search space, pre-computed, so to speak, and, and, and see whether any of those uh, solutions applies. And that's because uh, many data sets behave similarly because human problems tend to be similar too. Um, and the other aspect is that these large search spaces involve tons of computational power. And that's not particularly very good for the environment either. So AutoML, targets the automation of ML process for real world applications. It automates data pre-processing, feature engineering, with trying to extract information from the raw data, trying some uh, computable features, re reducing the number of features and training a model and, and trying to find which model to, to train based on that data, tune the parameters of the model, and then uh, try to check automatically for different type of problems and, and misconfigurations. So it does all that without any human intervention. You just give the raw data, you, you ship a database to the system, it, it runs for uh, two days, and then it gives you uh, a trained model. Uh, the simplest uh, AutoML, which I don't think people will call it that way, is the high parameter model search that come, for example, with scikit-learn. So here you are saying, I'm going to try these two kernels. Um, uh, RBFs and a linear kernel with the parameters uh, gamma um, 0 0.001 and 0 0.0001 and C1, 10, 100, 1000 for the RBF and the linear kernel with parameters C1, 10, 100, 1000. So um, this is two times uh, four is eight plus uh, for, so this will train um, 12 different systems and pick using this particular scoring function, recall macro, at the end, pick the one who, the parameters that did better. So um, you, in um, maybe 10 years ago, this thing will have been done by hand by a person. Now you just put these lines of code and uh, it runs all those possibilities. Uh, the interesting thing is that the, 
machine learning, many machine learning professors uh, I know of are that are working actively on, on AutoML consider that what we call these days uh, rogue ML or, or these uh, uh, fine tuning uh, models and, and parameters to uh, particular use cases uh, for um, uh, production use will no longer be a thing that will be completely absorbed by the AutoML systems. Um, I do agree that that AI or, or machine learning will not longer be applied apply to the type of probabilistic programming using uh, feature engineering over small data sets, uh, but I don't expect that will disappear either. Yes, it will just stop being called AI. Yes, and that's very common in AI, yeah. The, there was a time, for example, that search, like find a string in a document was part of AI. But the point is that you know, the, the the field is working actively towards moving entry-level tasks in data science uh, to making them obsolete. So it's uh, to me, it's, it's quite important in terms of uh, uh, what you are focusing when you are doing these cycles of training models, etc., and things that are outside just the the, the numbers that the the, the things are, are giving you, which then bring us to the issue of, uh, well, how are you going to, if, if you are working in a new domain, uh, how can you put more insights? Yes. Well, there is the part of like, maybe you're not expert on the domain, but as you keep working on uh, the data, you become an expert on the data itself. Yes. There is this concept that when a person, a patient goes to see a doctor, there are actually two experts there. You have the expert in medicine that is a doctor, but then the expert on the patient's body is the patient himself or herself. Yes, nobody knows your body better than yourself. Um, so, so then the, the concept of data set expertise that, that you are gaining by, by studying the data and, and, and running experiments over it, uh, in a way is, um, a type of expertise. The other thing is, um, uh, data scientists, um, I mean, computer scientists, people may not be very sociable, but many data scientists are not computer scientists. And the possibilities of uh, reaching out to, to experts and to, to the other people, as I was mentioning, try to find out how the data was generated on the first time, uh, can have a massive impact. So in a way, the, the whole point is to learn the context around the data. Um, then when it comes to domain expertise, uh, domains that have been studied for a very long time have a lot of uh, know-how. Uh, a very common uh, case is in, in NLP and information retrieval that uh, we have come around that certain words um, are not useful for the type of task we, we like to do over them. And we put them into this list called stop words. You know, list of words like for, a, to, the, of, that. So if we remove them, they tend to improve the performance of a classifier. I mean, this is useful for the type of task we do. On the other hand, uh, of course, they are important for, for humans to, to read the text and understand it. And, and there are expressions that are only composed of stop words. Um, and then if you have um, this type of domain expertise, either because you, you are an expert on the domain you are working or you have access to experts, yes, how do you incorporate that information into the process? There are multiple ways. The one uh, we'll focus very briefly is in feature engineering. But uh, questions, comments? Are you saying something or? Ah, uh, no, no, no. I just want to mention that, uh, yeah, no, indeed that in, uh, actually, I agree completely with what you say, right? So that's why when we built this master, actually, we really tried to do this to, to put uh, the human in the loop and uh, 
do give you expertise. So now in the first year we learn all these technical things, but uh, but uh, in the like in the next years that's why we have all these different courses, non technical and non technical for the different domains exactly because we need the. Uh, we need this knowledge. So, for instance, in the class we saw already, you know, the things about NLP, the stop words, and so on, and how in some tasks they often help, but in some others they do not. Actually, I think I showed even the same example: the to be or not to be, of course, which is a, a classic one. But uh, yeah, and that's also why you know our program is not uh, you know, only for computer scientists, but we have it here actually the largest part of the people who watch are non-computer scientists. So who struggle now with the courses that we are teaching, but uh, but you have other skills that will be useful uh, later on. And on the other hand, for computer scientists, try to give the skills. So I totally agree with uh, with uh, with what you say. Yeah. So so being a first year is like okay. Don't don't lose. Uh, don't get so overwhelmed by the the technical stuff because your 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 non technical or or, or not specifically technical stuff is, is what gonna make you shine as a data scientist later on. Yeah, but you still need to do all the homework, so of course. Of course, and those uh, heaps are stacking <laughs> up, piling up. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk about things uh, um, uh, more on my uh, <clears throat> Uh, comfort zone that is feature engineering. So feature engineering is the process of uh, representing a problem domain to make it amenable for learning techniques. So it, you go from this raw data that is, is less well defined, it just depends on how they're giving you the, the data to these nice feature vectors that you fit, fit to your uh, machine learning system. And the process then involves the initial discovery of the features and their stepwise improvement. And you are improving the features based on domain knowledge and the observed performance of a given ML algorithm over some specific training data. And overall, what we want is to have good features, which are informative. So they describe something that makes sense to a human. They are useful. So they are defined in as many instances as possible, and they are discriminant. They divide instances according to the different class. So the cycle of feature engineering contains the ML cycle we saw at the beginning in here, and we're iterating over that ML cycle. Um, and uh, what we are trying to do is, uh, uh, on each of these iterations, we improve the featureizer. So we improve the, the program, the component that takes the raw data and um, um, transform it into uh, into features. And after, at the end of this whole process, that chances it might overfit, we do a final evaluation to, to make sure that, that the system is still behaving well. So we, we actually keep some raw data held out for final testing. That's because as we are changing the representation of, 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 of the input to the problem, there are good chances that we will uh, overfit uh, and harm the ML. And one technique to avoid that is to use data and stages that I will talk at the end. So this is definitely a human in the loop process, yes. Um, and it hinges on two key analysis, uh, error, exploratory data analysis and error analysis, and I will discuss them in turn. Uh, but an example of feature engineering is just a simple feature uh, drill down. So you, you, you take your system, you run it, you train it, and then you do some error analysis and decide that there are some features that are bad, that are performing poorly, that are not very informative. So you just drop them. Why? Because less features in general means less parameter models and simpler models uh, tend to uh, overfit less and, and are using the, the available data uh, to have more informed parameters. Or you find some features that are very good. So, then you can provide variations over those features. So you can combine them, yeah? So this is the type of, of things you will do in feature engineering. So the, the, the first part uh, in, in machine learning, general statistics and feature engineering is to do exploratory data analysis. So you analyze the data sets to summarize their characteristics, usually through uh, visual means, and that let you help you formulate hypotheses about the data. Uh, in the machine learning case, we 
help us pick which machine learning model we are going to use over that data and, and help the, the initial futurization. So when to do a exploratory data analysis? Well, every time you have new raw data. I, I would advise to resist the temptation to jump into model building right away. Yes, at least you want to have some general idea of the data that so you can decide which model to train. And um, also, many times new raw data is received regularly. Uh, in those cases, some lighter EDA is still need to be performed to make sure that the assumptions that you capture at the beginning are still hold, yes? Because data drift, uh, and model evolution is a common issue. And um, uh, if your assumptions uh, can uh, be expressed in, in code, these checks can also be automated. Uh, a big question is how to do exploratory data analysis, yes? Uh, it's very data dependent. Um, it's usually taught in statistics courses you, you, you can run a battery of, of common statistical text, tests to try to characterize the distribution of the data. Uh, if you want to see examples in the context of data science, the, the open source code that I made available uh, uh, with my book contains multiple examples of EDA over graph, text, image, and, and time series data. Uh, that's part of uh, a data set um, that I put together and is freely available. Um, predicting the population of towns and cities based on their properties, their textual description, historical population, and satellite imagery. Um, so for a little example of exploratory data analysis, uh, here we're using the Wikipedia uh, webpage for um, um, 80,000 cities. And we're trying to see whether the, in the exploratory data analysis, whether the population appears in the Wikipedia page and whether there are some hints on the Wikipedia page that will let us know whether the, the size, uh, the population of, of the city, even if the population itself doesn't appear. So we take a, a, a random sample and we analyze them. And from there, we can see that um, half the, that bigger cities have longer pages so text length looks like a promising feature. And uh, most pages mention the population inside the page, but with different types of punctuation. Yes. And um, so that's the type of insights you can get. And from there, decide to use certain type of techniques and uh, certain types of features. From this particular example, what I decided was to start by just using the numbers that appear into certain uh, buckets as the features. So not use all the words, but just the numbers. Hand in hand with exploratory data analysis, we have the error analysis. Yes, uh, error analysis is normally always performed just at uh, aggregate metrics, just precision, recall, accuracy, uh, area under the, the rock uh, curve, yeah. But uh, for feature engineering, we want to look at uh, more detail. Yeah, so we want to identify uh, erroneous instances or classes of instances that contribute to con uh, substantially to the error and uh, drill down on them and make a hypothesis for why they are failing. Yes, and once we have this hypothesis, try to quantify uh, how, how common are these cases of errors. So we, we will only address things that are actually worth fixing. This requires a, 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 a system that is uh, quite well instrumented. So the machine learning um, allows you to, to say, okay, I have this thing fail. Why this? Why the model behave that way over this instance? That that's not uh, straightforward or trivial. Sometimes you, for doing good error analysis, you may need to write much more code than to train the system. Uh, another point about error analysis is uh, you, many, you don't need to do it alone. This is a great place to involve the future users of the trained model. Yes, because their feedback can go beyond the errors alone. Yes, you may realize that um, the model you are building solves the wrong problem. Yeah, 
uh, because communication uh, over things that have error and are not uh, super well defined is quite hard. So it's much easier when you have real output for a trained model to, to have a, a very clear communication. So for an example of error analysis that uh, come from my book, um, for this same task of, of prediction of population, uh, here are a few cities that uh, doing some changes with the, with the features, they perform worse than uh, before. Yeah, so, so we, we did some changes that improve the system performance in the aggregate metric, but there is this, all these other cities that are still not doing well. And uh, by uh, looking at them, uh, we can realize that there are some errors uh, and issues with, with the type of features we are using, the type of tokenization we are doing, the tokenization is missing uh, certain things. And certain others, for example, it's a big city, but it's described as a town. So the, the, that wording is, is not uh, uh, very successful, yeah. Or there is um, uh, another city that, uh, is, is, is a very large city, but it is mostly agricultural and, and the training data agriculture is normally associated with smaller places. For another much complex uh, uh, error analysis, this is a, a, a system with historical data. So we have the same uh, feature vector for the three years, 2016, 15, and 14. And what we can see here for the color encoding is the change of the values of the features over time. And uh, what I'm plotting here are some cities that got worse with some particular change and some cities that got better. And from this type of uh, plotting, we can try to see whether the changes over features are having an impact or not. And again, making this type of graph was much complicated, much more complicated than just training the system on the historical data. But um, having good uh, quality error analysis is the difference between flying blind or actually making meaningful uh, improvements over the system. And if you are flying blind, you are no different from the auto ML. So another way of um, considering this thing is that uh, we are trading the amount of, of data with, with human time, yes? So in computer science, as, as you are seeing on, on this course, there, there is a, a lot of trade-off of time and space. Yes, you, you can speed things up by using a cache, yes, that, that uses more RAM, or you can use less RAM and do multiple passes over the data, which takes more time. So to, to me, in, in, in um, uh, data science, uh, if, if you have large amount of data, then you, you, you won't need uh, feature engineering. In reality, if you have large amount of data, uh, you, you will need very little uh, human smarts, yes? And that's the premise of, of deep learning. You, you can synthesize better feature representations using neural nets. Um, but if you don't have enough uh, data, then you can use uh, humans' time and, and acumen to uh, make up for it. And uh, we like to give you uh, uh, <clears throat> the, this is the last topic I have on, on, on feature engineering is uh, what is called supervised feature engineering. So it's a transformation of the features that uses the target class. Yes. So in the, the, the way this works is that we have a, a feature that has categories and we are representing the category by the percentage of time that category appears with, with a target class. Yeah. Uh, so let me show you an example. So you have here the, the feature that can be A, B, or C. Yeah. And then the target class can be positive or negative. So the feature A, when the value of the feature F is A, 100% of the time, the target is, is a plus, yeah? So it's 1.0. When, in, on the other hand, the feature B is 40% of the time, and the feature C is 50% of the time. 
So when we do target rate encoding, we replace this feature F that is a categorical feature ABC to a plot floating point number, which is come from this table. Why I'm bringing this uh, in the context of um, uh, machine learning cycle is because you may notice that for doing this transformation, we are using the target value. We are using the value of T. So that means that now I, we have peaked into the evaluation, into the target value to, to get these scores. Uh, if we were to use this as is, these features now contain part of the information on the target. So the machine learning is going to uh, say, hey, this feature is amazing. It really knows the target. It, it, it knows the future, yeah? Uh, so you cannot estimate these target rates on the training data because otherwise when you train on that, the machine learning is going to, to be a sucker for these features. So, so then if you have train set and test set, now you have to have as part of the train set that you're using for estimating this type of supervised feature engineering and the train set proper that you will use to train the, the model, yeah? And, and as you start doing this type of manipulations, uh, you, you end up having to partition your, your train set into smaller places to estimate different things. And uh, this is something that um, otherwise well, what you get is what is called a target leak, where the target information is leaking into some of your features. And this is a very common problem that leads to overfitting. Um, and we get to the end of the lecture that we want to discuss about uh, staging the data. And um, the concept of staging the data is very simple. You just take your data, you, you split it into slices, yeah, to different stages. And then you, you start with a small, the first stage, you train your system there, you evaluate it on the second stage. Uh, and some moment you say, okay, I'm done. Then you move to the first stage past the second, you train your model there and you evaluate it in the third stage. The third stage data, you, you have never used it. You have never seen it. So that gives you an idea about how well your system is behaving uh, completely afresh. So that, that will give you a, an evaluation number that is as close to production as you can. Then you continue working, improving your system that now you are training on stage one and two and you're evaluating on stage three. And when you, um, when you are, um, uh, some moment you, you are comfortable with the numbers you have, you train it out in one, plus two and three, and you test in stage four, etc. This way uh, will give you all the time an evaluation number that is as close to, to the production behavior. And also the drop between what you were getting uh, quality before versus the new stage, give you an idea how much you are overfitting. Uh, the main drawback of this is that, well, you, you, you don't use all the data at once and you need to know how many stages are you going to do beforehand to split the data. Okay, so to conclude, we have seen the basic machine learning cycle. We have talked about AutoML, talk about feature engineering cycle, human in the loop, and uh, a little bit about staging data. Um, just a comment, uh, somehow I, it's, a discord, it's a teaching thing and it's a, it's a narrative thing. Uh, many of the things we do in, in, in machine learning and data science don't work, yes, uh, but teaching or, or saying, well, I did this and it didn't work, doesn't sound very encouraging or, or doesn't or make people, it doesn't look like you know what you are doing. So, so most of the time we show things that work, but when you actually sit yourself to do it, it's not going to work. And, um, and you will be doing everything correct and still won't work. So, so that's a little hard to, to, to teach something that has a success rate as low as feature engineering 
you know, 10, 20% success rate is, 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 is quite likely. Uh, so keep that in mind when, when you start uh, working. Okay, so in the book, Rules of Play, um, there is this discussion that games have multiple layers, yes? You have the, the rules to move the chess pieces, yes? But then you have rules for playing a certain opening. And if you play chess Sunday morning with your father every week, there is a certain rules that you're following there too. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a layer of, 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 of games. So to me, machine learning and, and, and data mining, the cycles is, is similar. Yes, you have different levels and, and this, the lower levels encompass the, the higher ones. Uh, and my belief is that uh, the, the process is better than iteratively starting from exploratory data analysis uh, and then doing error analysis after each iteration and having a human in the loop. And you can tap into domain experts to go faster and achieve uh, better results. And uh, as uh, Ari uh, mentioned, I wrote uh, this book on feature engineering. This book is uh, targeting people who are already working on the field. It contains a large uh, number of uh, uh, techniques for feature engineering, but then um, you, you might find uh, the source code a little more interesting and that's uh, open source. And of course, uh, you are welcome to uh, contact me on Twitter if, if you have any follow-up or questions, but uh, I look forward to um, uh, hearing your, your questions and comments now.